Well, good morning, everyone. Um, really nice to join you on this summer school. My name is Simon McIntosh Smith. I'm a professor of high performance computing at the University of Bristol in the UK. Um, and my background is in computer architecture and in parallel algorithms. I've been designing and building different kinds of supercomputers for ooh, 20 years now. Um, and it's a really interesting time in in this space. You're joining in a in a really interesting time when there's lots of different things going on, lots of really exciting new technologies and architectures. And so I'm going to share some of those important trends with you um, this morning. The first thing to notice is that um, what we're seeing is the next generation of supercomputers, the kind of things that are going to be coming out over the next few years, are much more diverse than we've experienced in, the, say, the last 10 years or so. And if you just look at the exascale systems that we're expecting to see over the next year or two, um, they're all very different. Uh, in the past, they were probably all going to have Intel CPUs, and if they had graphics processors in them, they would have all been NVIDIA GPUs. It was, it was essentially relatively homogeneous for the last 10 years. But looking at, say, the current number one supercomputer, Fugaku, it's a CPU-only system based on ARM CPUs from Fujitsu, the A64FX. Then if you look at Perlmutter, which is the, the largest sort of pre-exascale system that's being installed recently in, in the US, that's got AMD CPUs and NVIDIA GPUs, so mixes from two different vendors. Then we've got Frontier and Aurora and El Capitan, exascale systems expected over the next um, three years. They've got a mix of some have AMD CPUs, some have Intel, some have AMD GPUs, some have Intel GPUs, some have NVIDIA GPUs. Um, so there's really a mix of everything. This is much more diversity than we've seen um, in recent times. And there are good reasons why this has been going on, actually. Uh, and then if you look closer to home, if you look here in Europe, um, you look at Euro HPC, there are three pre-exascale systems that are appearing in places like Finland and Italy um, and Barcelona, and then five petascale systems, all trying different kinds of architectures. Again, different mixes of ARM, or AMD, or Intel, or NVIDIA, all kinds of different mixes um, to try the diversity and see what see what might be best for your area of science. Um, and even right here, where I'm based in the UK, we have a, a UK HPC ecosystem, which has been designed to be very deliberately diverse. And again, the reason is to give us experience of all the different technologies to see which ones might actually be best because we might find that NVIDIA GPUs might be best for machine learning, but maybe Intel GPUs might be best for something else and AMD GPUs might be best for, for something else and so on. Um, here we've got um, our tier one systems, the largest systems in the UK. We, they're at um, Archer, that's for everyone in the UK, hosted by Edinburgh. We've got some in the Met Office for weather and climate codes. Dirac is all our astrophysics type work. And then we have what we call tier two and there uh, I actually run the, the Great Western 4, the GW4 Isambard system, um, which is based on ARM. And again, in our tier twos, we have kind of one of everything, all the different all kinds of options um, tried out in our different tier two, our regional centres. So I run Isambard, which is um, an ARM-based system. It was actually the first production ARM-based system in the world back in 2018. And that's been running really well. It's been a big success. It's been really stable. Uh, most people can use it just as easily as any other cluster, which was a, a, a key target for us. We've got over 600 users on this system. They use it just like any other cluster. They don't really care that it's ARM, which is which is great. Got little bits of everything else in this system so that people can do rigorous comparisons. So we have so that we can try this diversity. We have some AMD, we have some Intel, we've got some NVIDIA, we've got some IBM, um, and we've got a little bit of all the latest stuff coming later this year. Two, if you'd like to read up all about what we've learned from this ARM-based system, uh, there's a key paper from CCPE a couple of years ago. You can follow the link for that one. I'll make sure you get these slides after the talk as well. Uh, and we've also been looking at dense GPU systems in the UK. One of our tier twos is called Jade. That's got lots of NVIDIA Teslas in it and some very fast memory so that you can do some big data streamed through lots and lots of, of GPUs. Um, and we're also looking at slightly more exotic technology. So I've mostly talked about CPUs and GPUs so far, but there are other things coming too. For example, there are some processes designed specifically for machine learning. Uh, some of these are from startups, but some are from companies like Google. 
So Google has these TensorFlow processing units now, or TPUs, that you can only get through Google Cloud. So you have to actually use these in the cloud. Um, and they're really, really fast. If you're doing these sorts of machine learning algorithms, which many of you might be, then um, trying these TPUs might be really interesting. There are companies specifically doing this as well. There's a company called GraphCore. It's actually right here in Bristol that have been designing processes specifically for this space. Intel's been doing it. There's something like 40 or 50 different companies who've been looking at designing processes specifically for uh, machine learning. So Google's been building not just processes, which you can see on this board on the, on the left, um, but also entire supercomputers based on those processes, which is this big system on the right. They've been building these things they call pods, which are over 100 petaflops of compute for AI um, with lots of high bandwidth memory and a really fast specific um, mesh network built in. And these things are getting better and better. There's new ones of these coming out all of the time. Given how popular, how big business AI and machine learning has become, I think that's a long-term trend that is a very interesting one to watch. So if you're going to be working on bits of science or machine learning that could possibly exploit these sorts of architectures, I'd strongly encourage you to check this kind of thing out, not just the Google one, um, but everything else in this space. That's the Google version. I mentioned GraphCore. They've been designing these processes here in Bristol. They call them information or intelligent processing units, IPUs. Um, and these things are just crazy fast. They uh, they put four of these processes in a, in a box. And that gives you a petaflop of 16-bit floating point in a single uh, box, which has lots and lots of processes, which can run lots and lots of threads. Uh, but under the hood, it's, it's basically running TensorFlow or CAFE or PyTorch, one of these kinds of libraries, and it's doing all that for you. You don't have to kind of port your code to this so much as just use the right libraries. Um, that's actually the biggest single chip that's ever been made. It's slightly faster than, than Intel's, slightly larger than um, NVIDIA's latest chip in this space, actually. So that's very impressive. And then uh, anyone doing these AI machine learning chips tends to also build systems. So this is a graph core actually building pods, completely full of their um, IPUs, and they can have up to exaflops of 16-bit floating point in one of these big systems. So these are really interesting, exciting breakthroughs are quite different so it's definitely well worth a look now it's not all about this of course um, we're also seeing companies like nvidia starting to do exciting new things so nvidia in the last year has, has announced these uh, their own cpus they're now doing arm based cpus in fact nvidia is trying to buy arm right now it's not all been agreed so that still not might, uh, might might not be allowed to go through but at the moment they're, they're intending to buy arm um, they've announced their own cpu they're calling grace so this is a little mock-up from NVIDIA of, a, of an NVIDIA uh, GP on the right and then an, their own ARM-based CP on the left. And the first one's been called Grace after Grace Hopper. And the really big breakthrough this lets them achieve is they can have much higher bandwidth between the CPU and the GPU. So normally these things would be connected over a standard bus like PCI Express. And that might give you something like 64 gigabytes a second in either direction, which is not bad. Um, but compared to the memory bandwidth on the GPU, the GPUs have got maybe one to two terabytes a second of memory bandwidth. And then you've only got, you know, a tenth or twentieth of that between the CPU and the GPU. So that has been a real bottleneck. Once these things become very tightly integrated, which is what NVIDIA plans, you can have much more bandwidth between them. And in fact, NVIDIA is planning for something like 500 gigabytes a second between the two in both directions at once. So it's up to nearly 900 gigabytes a second between the CPU and GPU. So that compares to, you know, 1,000, 2,000 gigabytes a second from the GPU to its own memory. So that's much, much better balance. Um, so that's quite an exciting uh, development. These are going to start coming out in 2023. It might sound like a long way off, but you know, it's not that long until 2022. So um, it'll be here before you know it. That's a very, very exciting development. Of course, AMD and Intel are both selling GPUs too, so they'll be able to do something similar. So this isn't specific to NVIDIA, but it's a it's a trend, I think, with very closely coupled CPUs and GPUs that's going to be important in your uh, timescales, and it might change what does and doesn't work well on it, GPUs. So that's well worth keeping an eye on that as well. And there's a good link on the next platform about what NVIDIA is up to there. Um, just a bit more on the balance. This, so this is how 
an existing system might work where you have an x86 CPU from, say, Intel or, or AMD, and that might be supporting four graphics processors. They've typically had a fast network between the GPUs, which might give you um, uh, lots of bandwidth between the GPUs. And then each one of the GPUs has, say, two terabytes a second of bandwidth. So times four, that gives you eight terabytes a second of bandwidth to their own memories. But then the x86 might have, say, um, uh, 200 gigabytes a second of bandwidth to its own memory. But these are this PCI Express is a quite narrow link. You see it only 64 gigabytes a second to each GPU. And what NVIDIA is trying to achieve with this gray setup is each GPU would have its own CPU. They'd have much fatter pipes between them. Um, you'd have something like uh, you know, 500 gigabytes a second between each CPU and GPU, and they're all connected together. And the CPU's now got not 200 gigabytes each, but 500 gigabytes of memory bandwidth each, and now times four instead of times one. So you can see how there's much more bandwidth from the GPUs to the DRAMs than you had in the current setup. So this should, should mean you're able to process much larger data sets on the GPUs, <clears throat> which might be really interesting to you and what kinds of things you want to do. So lots of exciting things going on in architectures and hardware, which I think will be very relevant to you over the next um, few years. Now, I think all of that leads to essentially three big issues that you probably want to keep in mind. The first is that um, you're always going to have massive parallelism to think about if you're targeting big systems. For example, Fugaku, current fastest supercomputer in the world, 7.6 million cores. And each one of those cores itself is very parallel, right? So each one of those cores has two 512 bit wide vector units. So this is massive parallelism. If you want to use the whole system, you're going to need parallelism that's millions of ways parallel, at least. Um, pretty much every really fast system is going to be heterogeneous. There'll be CPUs and GPUs, possibly from different vendors. Right? This is something we've not really had to worry about much in the past. And there are more vendors than ever that you might be interested in trying. So not just the Intels and AMDs and NVIDIAs, but now maybe also Fujitsu and Marvell, maybe IBM for power, maybe Amazon for Graviton processors. They have really fast ARM processors now. They've had a new one coming out every year. Though Amazon will be due to have a new one coming out soon. It'll be well worth looking at. Um, Google with their tensor processing units and so on, more and more. So it's worth keeping an eye out. And the non-traditional architectures also look really interesting and might be very uh, worthwhile trying. So these uh, AI and machine learning optimized processors, things like the GraphQL IPUs, Google's tensor processing units, there are vector engines from NEC, there are field programmable gate arrays from companies like Xilinx and Altera, um, which are actually being bought by Intel and AMD. So they're becoming Intel and AMD processors. They're good at certain things too. So all kinds of interesting things that you might want to try that might give your algorithms a real kick. And then finally, all of these systems tend to have complicated memory hierarchies. So they don't just have a, a CPU and a DRAM. They've now got, as we were just talking about, you might, you might have high bandwidth memory on a GPU closely connected to a CPU with DRAM. And then that might be connected to some sort of non-volatile storage. You might have burst buffers. You might have big flash arrays, and then you might ultimately have disks and, and, and tapes. So all these big complicated memory hierarchies, and you might have to be responsible for staging and streaming your data through all of those different increasingly deep memory hierarchies to get the best performance. And there are good fundamental laws of physics reasons why all of these things are going to just become bigger and bigger issues, more and more parallelism, more and more heterogeneity, more deeper and deeper, more complicated memory hierarchies. So worth being aware of that. Um, the US is has this really interesting um, exascale computing project, DCP, where they're looking at all of these different issues. They've got eight different big projects uh, looking at these issues. Two of them are focusing on MPI at exascale. Um, two are focusing on task level parallelism and how that's a good way of breaking up a big problem into smaller pieces to run on these giant heterogeneous supercomputers. Uh, one's focusing on, on partition global address space or PGAS approaches, which is a, an interesting um, abstraction, which has always felt like it's in the future, but maybe with these new systems, it's becoming more and more relevant. So that might be worth looking at. Um, 
one of the projects is focusing on parallel C++. And actually, there's a, definitely a big future in parallel C++ in general. And two of the projects are focusing on low-level parallelism within the nodes as well. These are sort of very lightweight tasking um, projects. Well worth having a look at what the US is doing. I'd go and check out xscaleproject.org, see what things are going on there. Lots of useful ideas for, for things to be aware of for your, for your projects. Now, I've got some, some recommendations, some do's and don'ts for your immediate future. It's nice to turn some of this into some concrete things. So here's, some, here's my tips from working in this space for many years. One thing you definitely want to do is always expose the maximum parallelism you can within your code at every level you possibly can. Leave no stone unturned. So that means data level parallelism, loop level parallelism, thread level, task level, core level, socket level, node level, system level, everywhere you can find parallelism, don't leave it unlocked, expose it, because you will need it sooner rather than later, because these systems are so parallel now. Also plan for the long term. A general thing to be aware of is computation is becoming cheaper and cheaper, relatively, whereas moving data around, that's the expensive thing. It's taking longer and longer relative to doing, say, a floating point operation or an integer operation. So what you really want to do is, it, this means that you might it might be cheaper to recompute something than to try and store it and move it around. This might fundamentally change the algorithms you'd want to use in the future. That's well worth being aware of. Another thing I'd recommend, given the diversity of all these different architectures and different vendors, is that you want to use standard parallel programming languages and frameworks wherever you can. Don't get locked into a specific framework that only works on one vendor. That will be a, a mistake. So the kinds of things you want to be using, things like MPI for parallelism between nodes, everybody supports that. That should work everywhere. That's not going away anytime soon. MPI is safe. Um, parallel C++ languages like Sickle um, are really good because that should work on anything and work on CPUs, work on GPUs from anyone. Um, OpenMP, that works in C or C++ or Fortran, that should work everywhere too. Works on GPUs, works on CPUs. Um, newer languages like Julia should also be supported in most places. They're newer, so less mature, um, but their adoption is spreading quite rapidly. So Julia is kind of worth a look to. In your space, this idea of domain specific languages where you might express the, the mathematics and the science and the algorithms of what you want to do in a, in a platform independent way. And then another piece of software, some kind of compiler or code generator takes what you've written and then generates more platform specific code. Those are really good ideas. So domain specific languages are great. Um, using those to, to kind of insulate yourself away from this diversity of hardware is a really, really good idea. And then it doesn't really matter what that DSL is generating. You write in this nice, portable, uh, more generic uh, language. So domain-specific languages, DSLs are really, really good. The main thing not to do is don't get hooked into writing thousands and thousands of lines of code in a language that will only work from one vendor or on one bit of hardware. You'll always regret that. You'll always have to rewrite it in something else. Um, so just be be cautious of, of that. Um, some key takeaways for developing scientific software. Remember, we've got orders of magnitude more parallelism. You have billions of ways of parallelism you'll need to expose. Good news is in this space, there's lots and lots of parallelism. So it just means being conscious of this and making sure as you develop your code, you always expose as much parallelism as possible. Remember, we're going to have increased heterogeneity, increased diversity of architectures and hardware. A CPU plus X, a CPU plus something, more, more than likely CPU plus a GPU, but it could be a CPU plus some AI optimized processor or a CPU plus um, an FPGA or who knows what. So keep that kind of thing in mind as well. Um, MPI plus something else like MPI plus OpenMP and domain specific languages likely to be the, the main approach going forwards. So that's what uh, you probably really want to concentrate on. But if you're starting from scratch, it is worth looking at some of the emerging alternatives, things like Julia, um, things like parallel task frameworks, which you've mentioned earlier on. So there are lots of interesting things to consider. Anyway, 
hopefully what you've got from all of that is a little taste that this is a really cool time to be involved in this space. There's some really amazing stuff going on, some fantastically powerful hardware coming, really cool innovations, some brilliant software languages and frameworks and DSLs to make all of those sorts of things accessible to you. And you're going to be able to solve problems that no one else has ever been able to solve not even think about solving, not been feasible to solve, and you're going to be able to tackle them and solve them. And that is truly exciting. It's a brilliant time to be involved in this space. And I hope you really enjoy it and find that your workshop is, uh, is going to be fun over the next few days. Um, just a little bit more. If you want to find out more about what my group does, we've got um, our GitHub repo and you can come and find out all about the work my group does. Um, or you can email me or you can follow me on Twitter. I generally just use that for for research related things so you can follow me there and with that i have finished thank you very much for inviting me again i hope you have a good few days um i, I don't know what you'd like to do now if you wanted there to be time for a few questions or if you need to carry on um just let me know